Okay. Okay, can everyone see the thing? Yes, now we can. Okay, see. Okay, so welcome to week seven, guys. It's the second last week of mechanical training. So today we have like two special topics. One is FEA, finite element analysis, and the other is controls. These are kind of really advanced topics, and we won't expect you to know how to do this at the end of this lecture. But like, you'll hear other RoboJackets people talking about this, and like, so that you like know what's going on, so that you're not completely lost. These are kind of like a basic introduction. Okay, so like, let's see. We're gonna start with FEA, finite element analysis. So what is FEA? FEA is a computational method to just find like numeric numerically find internal forces, displacements, stresses, and strains for like complex geometries. So look at the uh, first picture on the top. Uh, let me get my pointer. So this is a simple cantilever beam. Like if you've taken a statics class, you might know like there's like already formula formula for finding out like the force at the end or just the displacements and you apply a load at the end. It's kind of a solved problem. There's not much complex going on here. You can solve this by hand. On the other hand, if you have like a complex geometry, so this is a piston. So how do you apply, like if a force is applied on one end, how do you calculate the stresses and stuff? How do you know? So this is a very complex geometry and for that we'll use FEA. And FEA can also be used for other things, say like thermal analysis, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of things. So how does FEA work? So imagine you have this complex geometry here. You can't really say it's a cylinder or whatever. So you break this shape down into lots of smaller pieces called elements. And these elements, so in this case, it's a tetrahedron, like four points. So these elements comprise like the entire thing. And like at the ends of the elements, these are called the nodes. So the collection of all the elements together is called a mesh, and the nodes are the points where the computer does the math. So like each element is just considered to be the uniform material. So let's assume this thing is made out of steel. So you assume that each element is just pure steel, that there are no defects or anything. And so where does the math it like calculate it keeps track of the forces at the nodes so external forces at the nodes and like it calculates the stiffness sorry it has the element stiffness matrix like depending on the material so like aluminum steel etc like all of these material properties should be in inventor and like it gives you like by finding out the nodal displacement it can give you the external forces so this is called static analysis. And so like static analysis is when you don't have any movement. It's sorry, give me a second. Hmm. Yeah, sorry. Static analysis is used for when um, like parts are not in motion. So like this is the equation for forces you have an acceleration you have damping factors these are excluded when you're only doing static analysis and inventor is only good for like static and modal analysis there are other softwares for fea such as ansys and abacus that can do a lot more complex stuff but we don't really use that in robo jackets we also don't really need modal analysis which is used for vibration stuff so we're only going to look at stress analysis in Inventor. And we, stress analysis is only used in steady states. So like if you're in battle bots and you want to find out what happens when a weapon makes impact, we don't use it for that. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, like I hope people are taking care of questions in chat. Okay, moving on. So how can you know that your results are correct? 
So when you make a mesh, you're basically approximating the geometry of the part. So this part is just broken down into tetrahedrons, and it doesn't always have to be tetrahedrons. Like I've seen FEA where it's broken down into cubes or cuboids, etc. And FEA is basically a numerical approximation. So the geometry itself is being approximated. So let's say this end here is perfectly round. If you approximate it, it's going to be like an n-sided polygon because each of these tetrahedrons has a straight edge. And then like, if you choose even smaller elements, the size is going to be larger. Like the n is going to increase, but it's still going to be straight edges. So whenever you do math using this approximated geometry, you're going to have some errors. Another thing is the way the math works is like if your formula for whatever you're calculating is quadratic or something that is nonlinear, the computer uses a linear approximation within a single element itself. So like within a single element, it will use a linear approximation. So all of these errors from approximation can like stack up and like if you have a small error in per element, it could just be be like a gigantic error that could lead to wrong results. So how do you check like if your results can be trusted or not? One solution is to make your elements smaller and run the experiment again. So I think in this, the elements are half the size of the elements over here. So the density of elements is increased. And so this will probably change your value. And as a rule of thumb, you should probably make sure that your results do not change more than 5% after doubling the number of elements. So like that's a reasonable sign that your mesh is converging. And like if you're still unsure, you can keep doubling the number of elements. Just keep in mind that the more elements there are, the more computation time it takes. Okay, so another surefire way to guarantee that a result is trustworthy is to run actual experiments. Like you, sh you should have several trials and a good understanding of what variables you're controlling, and then you compare those results to simulation. This is not always possible, like say BattleBots, if you're like testing out a weapon and that weapon gets destroyed during a trial, then like it'll be expensive to keep creating the weapon again and again. So you might have to get creative with your experiments. And another sort of not so great way is to do a hand calculation. Hand the best for validating your results. Because, well, let's see. In order to set up your FEA for a part, you have to make some assumptions. And if you make the same assumptions for hand calculations, then you'll probably just make the same errors in your hand calculation as well. So this is probably going to be a problem because you'll think, oh, I got the same results, so it's probably fine. But then you won't actually attack the source of the problem. Any questions so far? Like hand calculations are still fine for like small certain Cases. So like if you do a hand calculation, you find like a stress should be 2,500 PSI, but your FEA gives you like some answer in the millions, then you know you've definitely fucked up. If your hand calculations agree with your FEA, then it's not necessarily a sign that you did it right. Okay, so let's look at an example. So you open up Inventor, you create this part, it's a rectangle with a hole in it, you extrude it, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, here's the important part. You set the material to aluminum 6061. Okay, I hope this part is easy enough for you guys to understand. Look at the dimensions here. Okay. Next thing, you open up environments, you do stress analysis, and you create a study. And then you press OK on the pop-up. Okay, if you didn't assign your material before, you'll have another chance to assign your material here. So. Inventor should have like materials preloaded into it, and what that means is it just knows the material properties, such as Young modulus, etc. 
And so, like, yeah, you can change the materials to AL6261. Like, you should know that different materials have different properties. Like, st steel is a lot stronger than aluminum. You don't want to analyze a wrong material, of course. And applying boundary conditions. So if you've taken any class in differential equations, you should know what boundary conditions are. If you haven't, let me just briefly explain it to you. So FEA is about finding out what happens inside the part, right? So boundary conditions are sort of like the assumptions we make. So this is stuff that happens on the outside of the part. So let's see, we're doing a tensile test with stress concentration, and we want to assume that this end of our block is fixed. So what does fixed mean here? So this face, like you apply the fixed constraint to this face, and what it means is that all elements on this face are going to have zero displacements. They're going to have zero rotations. So as you know, in 3D space, there should be like it can have possible displacements in the X, Y, and Z directions, and it can also have rotations around the same three axes. When you apply the fixed constraint, it's going to be zero. Like all of those values are going to be set to zero. OK, so okay. you set the fixed constraint on one end, and on the other end, you apply a load. So you can select force here. You can just apply any kind of load, but here we're going to look at it a load that points outwards so that the part is in tension. If you apply a load that points inwards, like the part will be in compression and that will lead to buckling. And that's a bit complex for us to look at right now. So make sure your load is pointing outwards. OK, then you click simulate and then run. Like the max stress view, click after you get run, you'll get some pretty looking images like this. Can you guys read these numbers here? Just this is just what I want you guys to look at. Just anyone? Yeah, I can read it. Okay, cool. Yeah, so this like scale will tell you like what colors correspond to how much stress there is. The max stress should be like 1.701 ksi, and like you'll be able to see like there's some red around these top and bottom edges of the hole. So this is how you find out like where the stress is distributed throughout this part. And this is just using, like this is just us doing this once. So we will do it again after we double the number of elements in the mesh so that we take care of approximation errors. Okay, refining the mesh. So to refine the mesh, you go to mesh view, you click on the highlighted icon on the right, and like you should be able to like uh, like have this number the average element size so now your elements are half the size and yeah notice how it says average not every element is the same size so yeah all of these small tetrahedrons they might be slightly different sizes of each other it computer tries to ensure that there's roughly the same size. There's not much standard deviation. There's not much deviation in the sizes. And so minimum element size is there just as a fraction of the average element size. OK, so one last step before running. OK, if you press OK here, it's not going to change things directly. So like. It'll just show you, oh, things have been updated here. Like these lightning marks, they will tell you that things have changed and you should probably just verify this before you run again. Okay, so yeah, you just manually update by opening this menu and then update mesh. And if you open mesh view, you'll be able to see like these elements become smaller after you update the thing. Okay. And so validating your results. OK, so now a direct experiment is better for this, but like this is just a basic example. We don't expect you to go create this thing in real life and run tests on it. But the good news is that other people have done that already. So there are empirical models for this kind of concentration. And we can just like use this 
table, sorry, this graph to like run our calculations and validate the results. So this is sort of like what the formula is. F over A gives you the stress, and this K is a constant that you comes from here. So over here on the bottom is 2R times W, R being this radius and W being the width. So for different kinds of bars where the hole might be bigger or smaller, or the bar might be wider or thinner, like you use this sort of ratio and find out what the K value should be from this graph. And so you have your F. This is just something you decided when you were applying the load. You have the area. This is also something you decided when you created the part. And when you apply that, you get like 2.6 times 300 divided by 0.44, whatever this value is. And so after you refine your mesh, you'll find out that these numbers have changed. Now you're kind of over predicting the max, max stress. So back here we had 1.707 KSI. Now we've got 2.362. So there's might be some sort of over prediction here. So another thing is you'll notice that this right edge has just a green, the sort of like green, like apparently there's some stress happening here as well. And there's a red dot over here. I don't know if you can see it, but so this is happening because of the boundary conditions that we've applied. So our area of interest is this hole, but there's something happening here as well. So that being said, so max stress is occurring at the fixed end. So why do you think this is happening? Maybe there's an issue with the boundary conditions. So when we set the boundary condition to be fixed, the computer just assumes so it just set, straight up sets the displacement to zero. In real life, of course, that is not possible because let's say even if you super glued this bar with a hole in it to a wall, like there could be minor like some issues, like maybe the super glue wasn't applied uniformly or like just a high enough force should be enough to like remove the super glue. You never know. But anyway, that's not an issue that's not a big issue like we can always just physically test this out make our own measurements and like yeah because the computer assumes like this is a perfectly fixed end it'll assume that the stiffness of the elements there is infinite so like we use the f equals k x the stiffness formula just like a spring and then it will assume that k is infinite and from that we get x is equal to zero, like no displacement. It's not really an assumption of infinity. It's just that it acts as though it has infinite uh, stiffness. Ah, OK. Thanks for clarifying that. It's not a huge difference, but either way. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, this is only happening at the fixed edge. We do not need to consider this if it's not that important. You just need to worry about what's happening at the hole, which is what we're concerned about. OK, so near the hole, the stress around the concentration seem accurate, but it needs a bit more work. Like the error at the hole is around 13%. Like, as we said, the rule of thumb, it should be near 5%. This is a different error. Mm -hmm. So oh. when you're refining the mesh, right, your results from before, right? So like, let's say the max stress that you find in one particular area, you take that and once you refine it, if that value there changes by uh, less than 5%, then that means you know your mesh is converged. It's not necessarily that the error with respect to the real thing is within 5%, if that makes sense, uh, right? Okay. Like this 13% error might be actually due to something else, but essentially as you run the simulations and you increase the mesh density. Um, when I ran this myself, I found that the stresses around that hole were not uh, getting significantly bigger every single time I refined it, if that makes sense. So this uh, okay. error is just with respect to our empirical model. So the hand calculations we did before. Oh, I see. All right, thanks for explaining that. No problem. Okay, and okay, so moving on, just some last things to talk about. 
So you can probe specific locations. So like if in the bar you all were, you were also interested in like something else, some other places in the bar, like you could probe the specifically locations. You can also display where the max and minimum stresses are. You can also change colors and stuff here. Just you can play around with this when you're doing this on your own. So are there any questions regarding FEA? I hope chat is handling it. OK, so I will stop presenting temporarily. OK, so let me just check chat real quick. OK, good. So moving on. I will now go to controls. Okay, so our second topic for today is controls. Let it load. Okay. So let's say you have a robot car. You want this car to go from point A to point B. How do you do this? Just like think of different ways you might make your car go from point A to B. What can you think of? Just hoping for a little audience participation. Quant internally. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's how I would do it. That sounds like a very nonlinear problem. <laughs> That'd be a pain in the butt to deal with. Yeah. Uh, okay, let me go back to my slide. Mm. Well, anyway, so we want the car to start moving from point A. We want it to stop when it reaches point B. So this means the car will not have a constant velocity. It should first have an acceleration step, then a deceleration step, and it might have a step where it's moving at constant velocity between the two steps. This is what the graph should look like. Uh, let me bring up my pointer. So first it has a positive acceleration, then it drops down to zero, so this is probably constant velocity. Then it decelerates. And this is acceleration versus time. You compare that to velocity, and you can see the velocity is steadily increasing. It remains constant, then drops down to zero. And the same is for position. Like it keeps increasing, the slope is increasing here. And then this, it like increases at a constant rate. Then it slowly goes and like if you continued from here, the graph would just be straight at this point because it's not moving any further. So the robot car forms a system and the system can be represented with a state. And the state can be like defined as a bunch of variables that is position, velocity, acceleration. But you don't always need every variable to represent the state of a system. In this case, we only need position and velocity, and that's because we can represent the acceleration as a sum, not as a sum, as a function of position and velocity. Like there's some complex matrix math involved in this that we won't be going over. Anyway. Oh, let me go back. So anyway, controls is a way to like make sure your moving parts move the way you want them to. So you can apply controls to like a robot hand, or you could even apply controls to a thermostat, etc. Input and output. So input is the variable that we want to control, and the output is the variable that we want to observe. So in the example of a robot car, we probably want to control its position. And we want to observe like the position as well. Like in this case, it's both the same. But the input is always independent from state variable. So like if you apply an input to the velocity, it's not the same as the state of the car. Like this car might be moving at some certain velocity B, and you can add more velocity as an input. The output is usually chosen among the state variables, but it could be like a combination of them. You just need to be able to make sense of it for your own purposes. 
So open loop and closed loop systems. An open loop system is where like the input is applied without regard to the output. So this is what an open loop system looks like. Like you have the desired output. It's a, there, it has a controller. The controller puts an input into the system and it puts out an output. Kind of simple. A closed loop a closed loop system will factor the output into its input. And so here you can see there is a desired output. You put it into the controller. It puts it into inputs that into the system. And so here, like the system will check this output like by, via a sensor. And then those sensor will put like add that as input to the desired output. So the controller takes this as feedback from the output. And so this is how the system checks whether the desired output is reached. So as an example, a uh, clothes dryer would be an open loop because, well, you like you enter your settings for the clothes dryer by like turning knobs, pushing buttons, and then you hit start like and then your clothes are just dried. It doesn't actually check whether your clothes are dry or not. It just applies heat according to the settings you've added at the beginning. And so like that's the desired output is the settings that you added at the beginning. And then like blah, 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 clothes happen. Whether they're dry or not, the dryer itself does not care. Whereas a closed loop would be something like a thermostat. And so for a thermostat, you like set the temperature as a desired output, like maybe say 75 degrees, and then the controller the system will check, oh, is it 75 degrees? It's not 75 degrees, it's like say 78 degrees. So the controller will try to cool the room until it's 75. Then let's say it goes down to 72, then the controller will try to heat the room until it's 75. So it keeps checking what the output is, and if the output is not the same as the desired output, then it will apply like an input. So any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Okay, I hope chat is handling the questions. Okay, so what are the objectives of control? So as I said earlier, control can be applied to almost anything that moves or like whatever, even a thermostat has some sort of control in it. So regulation is where you try to force your state to an equilibrium state, usually zero, with a desirable dynamic response. So you just want your thing to remain stable. You don't want it to move too much. Tracking is where you force the output of the system to track a certain objective, a desired output. Say like if you have a robot that wants to chase tennis balls in a field, then like as the tennis ball moves, you try to move, like you want the robot to track that tennis ball. And a desirable dynamic response is such that the speed, stability, and steady state error flow like follow desired specifications like you don't want to take too much time right you want to reach the steady state within a certain amount of time but you also want to maintain the stability of the system like there's no point if your robot just goes super fast and destroys itself in the process and you also want to like minimize your steady state error so what is this error we're talking about so error is the difference between the current state and the desired state. And we want our system to make decisions based on this error. So like one way to do that is using PID control. PID control consists of three components, proportional, integral, and differential. And so like you will choose gains, which are like just constant values to achieve a desirable dynamic response for like you choose a P gain, an I gain, and a D gain. And you don't always need all three. PI control and PD control are also commonly used. But let's see what they do. So proportional control is like you just take the error and multiply it by a constant. What does this mean? Like if there's more error, 
you apply more input. If the error is smaller, you don't need to apply that much input, right? So this is similar to how a spring works. So this is at equilibrium. It's not going to move. There is a, if you pull it, then it, there's going to be like a kx, f is equal to kx. So the more you pull it, the stronger the spring will try to get back into the same position. If you push it, it'll apply the same input, but in the opposite direction. So integral control takes the area under the graph and multiplies it by a gain. This is sort of like predicting the future state, but there is no physical equivalent for integral control. You can still use it digitally, but there are no real world examples, like no mechanical examples for this. And let's see, differential control. So this thing takes the rate of change of error and multiplies that by a gain. So this is sort of like if your error is rapidly approaching the steady state, if, sorry, if your error is rapidly approaching zero, then you want to decelerate it harder. If your error is not that fast, like it's just moving slowly, then you don't want to decelerate it that much. You want to keep it going until it reaches zero. So this is similar to how a damper works. You know, so like if you apply a really high force on this mass here, the damper will try to slow it down harder. So how you actually choose your games? This like one way is trial and error. There are other more complex ways using like more complex mathematics, but we'll just look at the trial and error method. Works 90% of the time. It's just you have to do a lot of it. Just like keep doing it again and again to make sure your gains are correct. So you start by setting everything to zero and then you slowly increase the proportional gain until the output of your control loop like oscillates at a constant rate. Like if your proportional gain isn't high enough, like you might end up like never reaching your objective or maybe you'll just reach it very slowly. So once your P response is fast enough, like once your P gain is at a good value, then you set the integral gain. So this way the oscillations are gradually reduced. So like how I said, like integral sort of predicts the future. So like in this case, it'll try to just reduce those oscillations accordingly. So you change this I value until the steady state error is reduced, but it could increase the overshoot. So what does overshoot mean? Like your error reaches zero and then it goes in the other direction temporarily. That could be, that means the overshoot. Once you've set your P and I parameters and you've like minimized your steady state error, you increase the derivative gain until the system reacts quickly to its set point. So the derivative gain will decrease the overshoot and it'll make sure like there's not much vibration or anything. So like, as I said, derivative gain is sort of like a damping. So it decreases all the overshoot. So yeah, sometimes you might not need this I value. Sometimes you might not need this D value. Depends on your system. Okay, any questions? And just read chat for a few minutes. Time travel, this is some complex stuff. Okay. Well, then it is time for the Kahoot. I do have one question. Oh. Does this really factor into mechanical at all? It all sounds kind of elect electronic -y. <laughs> which I'm sure is a good thing to learn, but still. Yeah, controls. Well, robotics, as you know, is a combination of mechanical, electrical, and <coughs> software. Controls yes. also just falls into like all three of these. Like, of course, we didn't discuss the math here, so it probably doesn't make much sense to you, but like you need to know statics and dynamics analysis for controls. And so it's frequently taught in mechanical as well. Okay. Okay.
Okay, like I hope that answered your question. Another thing that might be interesting is that controls uh, in the sense don't always have to come from an electrical, mechanical, or a um, like computer system. You could develop a system and then see that it needs this type of control and then produce that control with mechanical components such as spring and dampeners um, elements or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think earlier in the 20th century, they used a lot of pneumatics for control elements, but yes. I could be wrong about that. Yes. In fact, I think circuits were a huge thing. I think if I recall correctly, I had a professor that, that made a PhD thesis on making essentially like an operational amplifier, except for pneumatic stuff. So you'd have uh, a pressure source, a pressure, a pressure drain, and then two pressure inputs, and then the output would behave just like an operational amplifier, therefore giving you perfect circuitry. <laughs> to work that's with so wow that's so funny that you uh, put that because that is my controls professor <laughs> oh i hated him <laughs> so bad <laughs> okay but yeah okay. he's so bad i don't want to talk about him. yeah wait you know how cool. i said my stats teacher was bad yeah. actually this guy's the worst professor i, I can't i can't oh there's so many oh i want to vent so hard but please just do the good <laughs> i'm doing his yeah. homework right now and it's so hard <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Like controls could like it sort of transcends all these engineering topics. Okay, let me just look at my. Actually, the one of the first uh, what's it called examples that my dynamics professor gave us for a control system was a a toilet actually because the hmm. plunger and some of the stuff that they include in there behaves just like a control system, right? It has feedback for like at a certain height once the water reaches that level. It'll uh, pull the plunger out and then uh, have all the water evacuate, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. So it's not quite like PID stuff, but it's still like a closed loop uh, circuit. Okay. Uh, share options. Yeah. Okay. Sharing system audio. Just because. Okay. Classic. Loading game pin. There you go. Hey, can everyone see the game pin? Yes, we can see it. The correct order of operations in CAD. This is like a general overview. Yeah. Looks like your basic red part of CAD. Yep. It is sketch, feature, part, and assembly. So, well, part sort of refers to the part as a whole, whereas feature means features off a part, which is why you do feature before a part. Moving on. Mm -hmm. After sketching a circle, what should you do to create a solution? Oh, that's so good. Sure, I'm gonna answer immediately. I mean, there are four of us. Yeah. So, what feature tool would you use to make this? You would use a sweep. Tool. Yeah, it's a cable. You would use a sweep. Cool. The only way to make screw holes is by extruding a circle. Is that true or false? That's good. You guys remember it. 
you can make holes as well. Mm -hmm. Next, what is the purpose of project geometry? Is it a function you can use an inventor? This was a bit divided. It allows you to access entities outside of a sketch's scope. So yes, technically it does make constraining easier and you uh, you don't get to view sketches in assemblies. That's not exactly what this is. But yes, so the second option is a result of the third part. So that is why this is the correct answer. You can also create complex shapes, but again, that's because of this thing. Okay. Let's see, how many 2D sketches are required for a sweep? Good, you guys got it. You just need two perpendicular 2D sketches for a sweep. Okay, what feature in CAD is used to follow out the That's right. With the shell, you can just set a thickness and it'll hollow out the body. What is the best way to cat a sphere? No unnecessary lines. So think of it this way. What is the minimum number of steps that you can need? It's going to revolve a semicircle. Hmm. Okay, yeah, this was divisive yesterday as well. Like, you could revolve a circle as well. Can you? You can't do that in SOLIDWORKS. Hmm? Are you able to revolve a circle? Because in SOLIDWORKS you can't do that. And that's what I'm used to. Yeah, like, I know in CAD it might say, like, the sort of geometry overlaps when you try to revolve a circle. I think it's, there's also a way to just revolve it 180 degrees as opposed to oh, okay. circle. Okay, anyway, in Inventor 2021, the light is purple. Purple means it's undefined. That's good. You can remember colors now? <laughs> Just sort of the stuff you would notice if you're using Inventor. I will say that I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, I don't recognize specific shades of blue. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. True or false? In assemblies, you can constrain the origin. It is true. Well, if you're just starting an assembly and you only have one part, you want to constrain it somewhere, right? So you constrain that to the origin. Okay. Yeah, these are our results. Congrats to Nick. Played. Okay. Okay, any questions? Anything? If not, let's move on to our CAD guide. Okay. Loading, loading. Okay, so this week we're going to learn how to do a drawing. So this double solenoid stand is just a part that we have. Okay, so what is a drawing? Basically, when you design a part in a CAD software, you want to make that part using different things. And if you're not using 3D printing, like if you're using like a mill or something, then you'll have to like communicate this information to a machinist somehow. So like, how, what is the size and like tolerances of your part? Like what kind of interactions are you going to have? What kind of material do you want the part to be made out of? Etc. Etc. So what should you want from a drawing? Your drawing should be clear. Your dimensions should be clearly communicated. And you don't have to over dimension the drawing. You just keep it simple. You can be robust. But like 
changes should not break the drawing. And so this part, okay. Here, okay, there is a link to this file. I don't, I haven't actually looked at this file, but yeah. So anyway, to create a drawing, first you'll just take this part. You can like new drawing. And like this will allow you to create a drawing directly from this part. There are other ways to make a drawing, but this is sort of like the easiest one. Like you make your part first and then you get a drawing. So your drawing will start out blank and you can like change like settings and stuff to make it look the way you want it to look. So first thing you have to do is make sure your sheet is of the right size. So like you right click sheet one in the model tree here and you click edit sheet and you'll get this pop up box where you can sh like change the size. The default in US is size A. Sorry, not. So the default is size D, but like in US, we prefer size A. Other places might have other standards. Ooh, there's also an A4 option if you want that. And the size NC large is also too big for a sheet. You can delete this and double click NC A. And then you can edit your title block. Uh, let me pull my pointer. This part over here is called the title block. It contains your information like the name of the part, and like tolerances, just name of the company, et cetera, et cetera. Just logistical information that is not directly related to the parts. And you can like make the title box larger so that it's more visible. And then you can like add your part to the sheet. So you can select the base icon. It'll create a view of your part. And then you can like move your part from here to create other views. So, like this is a side view. If you move it to the top, this is a top view. This is obviously the front view. And you can also like define the scale and stuff. You can like make your lines transparent or solid or whatever. And like this is sort of like an isometric view, I believe. So now you want to add your dimensions because that's what the whole point of the drawing is. So like these dimensions should already already be defined in the part itself. Like the IPT file, if I'm looking it right. Like you don't have to like redimension here anyway, but like you can just select dimension and it will just say what the dimensions are. So you want to communicate these dimensions in a way that makes sense, right? So let's say you select this edge over here and you select this edge over here and that should communicate like the length and width of this rectangle. So after you've selected this edge, you don't need to select this edge over here to display its dimensions because the machinist should know that this edge is the same as this edge and it'll have the same lengths. Okay, these two circles over here, like if they are the same radius, then I think there is a way to show that like they have the same constraints or so. But anyway, like you can select the two circles, select the radii, and you can like you don't have to then show the same thing over here. But this thickness over here, this is not displayed in the front view, so you might want to like add this dimension here. Okay, there are also holes at the bottom, so maybe this dim like this diameter over here, you might want to display that. Basically, you just want to show dimensions that make sense to the machinist so that when you hand this over to the machinist, he knows exactly what you want to make. Anyway, once you place a dimension, you can double click for a box to pop up. Oh, yeah. And yeah, this is how you can like edit the settings for your dimension. You can elect to put in different text under dimension. You can also like add tolerances. 
So like if these holes have certain tolerances at like dimension, so like 0.1 inches plus or minus the tolerance. And like generally for tolerances, you do symmetric tolerancing. And you can also change significant figures. Significant figures are important for precision related purposes. So also like maybe if it's a really high tech mill, like your machinist might be able to guarantee you certain precision. So like he might say, oh, you can add more precision or something. Anyway, if you're making holes that are tapped or threaded, you can also just select the hole and thread. So this is like a code. Like we covered uh, threads in what week four, I think. Uh, but yeah, you can add that sort of information here as well. So maybe if you want to screw stuff in here, you can just add the kind of tap hole you want. Uh, anyway, so you usually want to give the manufacturer a bit more information on the part so that he can make it to your ideal specifications. Like you can double click on the dimension and this kind of box will pop up. Edit hole, this is sort of the for like the information about the thread and stuff. This box also has a variety of symbols. So like how how deep you want your hole to be, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So let's start drawing this part using the fundamentals. We will first determine all of these dimensions. Oh, I think I already described this stuff. Like, yeah, if you have this dimension over here, you don't want to add more dimensions over here. Like you can also just add notes here. Holes are the same on the top and the bottom. So yeah, there are holes on the top and bottom. They're just the same. So now you don't have to repeat this information at the bottom. And like you just want to prevent like guesswork. You just want to make it as clear as possible. Like your machine shouldn't have to guess anything. So you can add other dimensions as well. The rule of thumb is to keep separate dimensions on like different views. So mm, like we're describing this hole in the center here and you can see like this, like the center of this hole is a certain distance from the bottom, but we're displaying it over here as opposed to here to make it less crowded. Mm -hmm. To put tolerance on threaded holes. Okay, yeah, so there's a tolerance on the threaded holes in the lower view as well. This is because this particular part needs to be centered rather precisely. So this thing needs a greater detail to attention. Okay. And so you can export this as a PDF. And like most manufacturers do not actually use CAD software, they just manage the machining and stuff. Like I know Robocup orders from a certain place where you literally just give them the drawing and they'll just make the part for you. They don't need to know any other extra details apart from the stuff that's in the drawing. So yeah, basically you just really want your drawings to be clear, very clear and efficient. You just want the machinist to understand everything exactly the way you want it to be. Okay, and making DXF files. This is bonus material from Alex, our president. He knows how to use the water jet, so we listen to him. Anyway, as covered in one of the previous lectures, a DXF file is a 2D file format which we use for the water jet. So as you know, water jet can only cut 2D profiles. And like the water jet will also just cut all lines that show up. So you need to be careful what lines are on the file. Uh, give me a second. So again, just like before, we can make a new drawing, but apparently there's a way to like just right click and export it as a DXF file directly, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. You can just place the part using base and you just have to display one face this time. So unlike the previous time where you had different views, you only need one face here and make sure you keep the scale at one to one. 
because otherwise your water just will just cut a part that's way larger or smaller than you need. Okay, and then there are dotted lines here that could be a problem now. So we can't cut those hidden lines. So make sure you remove the hidden lines because uh, the water jet literally just cut all lines it sees. It's not going to know that this is supposed to be an internal component. So there are a few ways to do that. Like in drawing view, there are these options here to like display or hide hidden lines. You can also just delete. You also have to delete the border and the table. So like the stuff we've seen before, like the t title box and stuff. You don't want that in your drawing. You literally want your drawing to just be the face that you want to cut out of your material. Then you can just save, save copy as. It has to be saved as a copy. And select the file as DXF. So you're not making a regular drawing, you're making a DXF file. And then you just hit finish. Yeah, and that's it. So any questions regarding drawings or DXF files? Let me look at chat. Ooh, how do I change global sig figs? I think that might be something you can do in if you click on file and then I properties, I think that's where you might be able to do that. I'm not 100% sure. Okay, so by global you mean for every dimension, right? Yeah, I think so. Probably just like changing the default. Yeah, I think understand. that should be in like document properties. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, just because when you, uh, when I edit the tolerance for uh, the whole call out, it lets me, it says like, do I want to set it to the global uh, significant figures or whatever, or do I want to make custom? And it'd be convenient to just do it three sig figs all around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I don't know in Inventor, I know in Creo, like there is a way to do that in like document settings where it applies it to the entire document itself. Yeah, I know how to do it in SolidWorks. I'm not, I don't know how to do it here. I'm not seeing it mm -hmm. in document settings. Hmm. Okay, I'm not a hundred percent sure about that then. All right. Okay. Would it ever make sense to have mixed sig figs in a drawing? Have like one thing have three places, but one of everything else have just two? Probably not. Well, ideally, if like you should keep the highest number and you should keep it uniform. Right. Like, I don't see why you'd want fewer significant figures if you can ask for more. You know? Okay, well, uh, thanks for coming, guys. I hope you all clicked the attendance. Yeah, honestly, if you need to change the sig figs, just Google it. I, I really don't know where to <laughs> find <laughs> it by hand. Yeah, thank you all for coming. All right, see you guys. Thank you. Yep. See you. See you.